In this video, I will talk about the relationship between optical activity and chirality. What is optical activity? Optical activity is the ability of a substance, chiral substance, to rotate the plane of a plane polarized light. And it is usually measured using an instrument that is called the polarimeter. So what is the polarimeter and what is optical activity? The polarimeter is an instrument which has a light source and this light source emits light that oscillates or moves in different directions. However, when this light passes through a filter, a polarizing filter, only one of the waves which is moving in a certain direction will pass. All the other ones will be removed. When this light, which is called the plane polarized light, passes through a tube which contains the sample that you are testing, then if this sample is optically active, which means that if this sample is able to interact with light, it is going to cause a rotation of this light. So this light, instead of moving undeviated, it is going to deviate with a certain angle alpha. This deviation could be to the right or to the left. And finally, at the end, at the analyzer or at the detector, the angle of deviation is analyzed. So whenever you have a compound and you place this compound inside a polarimeter, this compound can either interact with the light or it doesn't interact with the light. If, inter if it interacts with the light, then it is going to cause deviation of this light with a certain angle alpha. If it doesn't dev deviate or interact with the light, then no deviation will be observed. So, for example, let's say we have a compound which is 2-butanol. 2-butanol is a compound which has one chiral center, and this is the chiral center. Now, 2-butanol exists in two forms. If this chiral center has a wedged OH, this is going to be one form. If this chiral center has a dashed OH, then this is another form. Now, one of them, one of these two, causes deviation uh, uh, to the right, and it's called D-butanol, and the other one causes left deviation, and it's called L-butanol. If it is usually D, it is positive, the angle will be positive. If it is L, it's going to be negative. So, whenever you have a pure substance, such as, for example, to butanol, again, this substance is, can be either optically inactive, which means that it doesn't interact with light. So if you place it inside the polarimeter, no deviation will take place, or it is going to be optically active, which means that it is going to cause deviation of light. Now, this deviation can be to the right, and it's called dextrorotatory, or right, or clockwise deviation, or it go, could be levorotatory, or left deviation, or anti-clock deviation. So whenever you have an optically active compound, it can be either dextro or levo, plus or minus. And that's why we said here that we have D or plus 2-butanol, L or minus 2-butanol. So for example, these are the real structures of minus 2-butanol, plus 2-butanol. And remember that it's not necessary that whenever you have a dash, this is positive, and whenever you have a wedge, this is negative. No, this can be only determined experimentally. So for example, another compound, it could have a dashed bond, but this one is negative, okay? Or a wedged bond, and this one is positive. So some this thing can be only determined experimentally. When you see the compound drawn in this form, then this means that they are telling you that this compound is actually a mixture of both. So it is positive and negative, and that's why sometimes you will see this, which tells you that you have a mixture of a positive and negative to butanol. So what is the relationship between chirality and optical activity? We do understand that we have optically active compounds and optically active inactive compounds. But why is a certain substance optically active or optically inactive? Well, if you have a pure substance, as I said, it is going to be optically inactive or optically active. If it is optically inactive, then 
this is because it is an achiral compound. So whenever you have an achiral compound for any reason, an achiral compound will be optically inactive, which means that whenever you place it in the polarimeter, it's not going to cause deviation. Now, it could be achiral because it doesn't have a chiral center, or it could be achiral because it has a plane of symmetry. Regardless of, of, of the reason which made this compound achiral, whenever it is an achiral molecule, it is optically inactive. That's why you have to pay attention to this. Sometimes I could say which of the following molecules is achiral, or I could say which of the following molecules is optically inactive. I'm asking for the same thing, which is achiral versus chiral. If your compound is optically active, then it is going to be a chiral compound. And now it could be chiral because it has only one chiral center or because it doesn't have a plane of symmetry. So this is a relationship between optical activity and chirality. Whenever you have a chiral compound, then your compound is going to be optically active. Whenever you have an achiral compound, then your compound is going to be optically inactive. So let's talk a little bit about the rotation angle alpha versus the specific rotation angle. The observed rotation angle alpha is the measured rotation angle that is given by the polarimeter. So whenever you have a certain sample, you place this sample inside the polarimeter, and the, uh, at the screen of the, uh, of the polarimeter, you are going to see a certain number. This number is the observed rotation angle. It could be any number. 13, 14, 50, 60, 80, 90, whatever the number is. This number depends on the concentration of the solution, the length of the polarimeter tube, and it is not a constant number. So what, what do we mean by not, it's not a constant number? If you have a concentrated solution of 2-butanol, it's going to give you a certain number. If you have a diluted solution of 2-butanol, it's going to give you another a number. So this number is actually depends on the concentration and the polarimeter itself. So sometimes if you use a different polarimeter, then the same sample is going to give you different numbers. Now, in order to use uh, this information, which is the rotation angle, to identify compounds, we have to uh, find something which is called the specific rotation angle, which is usually placed between brackets. The specific rotation angle is a constant number, so it doesn't change. So for each compound, it has a certain value. For example, for 2-butanol, the value of the specific rotation angle is 13.5. So no matter what polarimeter you are using, no matter what is the concentration of the, of the sample that you are measuring, the 2-butanol is always, the specific rotation angle of 2-butanol is always 13.5. So this is a constant number which can be used as an identity to identify compounds. For example, whenever someone says that the boiling point of water is 100 degrees, then whenever you see something which is 100 degrees, probably it's going to be water. So this is the same uh, thing. But how can we find this value, which is a specific rotation angle? Usually you have to use this equation, which is equal to 100 times the observed rotation angle, and then you divide by concentration and the length of the polarimeter tube. So usually, experimentally, you will find this number you already know the concentration of your solution and you know the length of the polarimeter tube. By just applying this equation, you can find the specific rotation angle, which is again a constant number. So each chiral compound has its own specific value, which serves as an identity for this compound. For example, in this, in this case here, um, uh, they are saying that the observed rotation angle of a sample is equal to minus 0 0.78 and they gave us that uh, this is the length of the polarimeter tube which is 10 centimeters and then you have the mass of cholesterol and then you have the volume so you can calculate the concentration and by using all this information you can calculate the value of this alpha by multiplying 100 times of course the absolute value which is 0 0.78 and then you divide by the concentration, which is going to be 0 0.3 divided by 15. And then you multiply this by the length of the tube, which is 10 centimeters. Of course, you have to pay attention that you have to uh, do the conversions. 
So one decimeter is equal to 10 centimeters. That's why this number should be divided by 10, so that it's in decimeters. And this is going to be the concentration in grams per milliliter, but you have to find it in grams per 100 milliliters. So we will cover this later on. What if we have a mixture? So what if we, have, we don't have a pure substance? We have a mixture uh, which contains multiple substances. If you have a mixture, then this mixture, again, it will be optically inactive or optically active. If it is an optically inactive mixture, this could, there could be two reasons. Reason number one is that your mixture consists of achiral molecules only. So you have, a you have a mixture which consists of compounds that don't have chiral centers at all, or compounds which have planes of symmetry. So if your mixture consists of achiral molecules, then it's going to be an optically inactive mixture. The other option is that sometimes your mixture will consist of a 50-50 uh, mixture of a compound that's mirror image. What do you mean by that? So let's say you have a mixture which consists of this compound and this compound. This is the same compound, but we have 50% of the first compound, let's say, which has the R configuration, and then we have 50% of the other compound which has the S configuration. Well, in this case, the effect of the first one will cancel the effect of the second. So let's say this one has a plus or minus 13.5 uh, rotation angle. The other one will have plus 13.5, and that's why the net result will be zero. So whenever you have a 50-50 mix percent a mixture of a compound and its, its mirror image or its enantiomer, as we will see the definition of an enantiomer later on, then the compound will, the mixture will be optically inactive and it is usually called a racemic mixture. If your mixture is optically active, then it is either consists of compounds which are um, pure, so you have a mixture of compounds which are pure uh, and they are optically active, or you have a mixture but it's not 50-50. So let's say again, instead of having 50-50, you have 75% of the first one and then you have 25% of the second one. In this case, then since they are, don't exist in equal amounts, their effect is not going to cancel each other. And that's why we talk about something which is called enantiomeric excess. Enantiomeric excess, which is that once enantiomer, uh, so one form of the compound is in excess of the other, and usually you just subtract the percentage of the major one, let's say 75 minus 25, which is equal to 50%. And this is telling you that the major enantiomer is in 50% excess of the second one. And this is going to be the end of this video.